It is, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, unprecedented. The impeachment inquiry begins, and South Florida Congresswoman Donna Shalala weighs in with lessons learned from the last one. Let's try to get some stuff done in the meantime. The American people can render their decision one way or another. Running defense, Florida's governor calls the impeachment inquiry a charade. We'll take that to the roundtable. And I just want to get back and do what I was elected to do. Surprise win for Scott Israel. A Republican investigator says he should be reinstated. Will the Florida Senate put Scott Israel back as the Broward Sheriff? Good morning. So glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney. I'm Glenna Milberg. History is unfolding this week as Democrats move toward what could be the third presidential impeachment in U.S. history. A whistleblower complaint was made public that accuses the president of promising to release nearly $400 million in military aid to Ukraine if they would just do him a favor. Dig up some dirt on Joe Biden and his son. Then we learned this week that the White House tried to cover it all up. These are stunning developments that set off new calls for impeachment. Most House Democrats have been cautious in calling for an impeachment inquiry, but the transcript of the phone call between President Trump and President Zelensky of Ukraine changed the equation. Here is what the president had to say about all of this. Just watch a little bit of this on television. It's a disgrace to our country. It's another witch hunt. Here we go again. South Florida Democratic lawmakers are among the 224 House members who, as of this morning, support an impeachment inquiry. That's 223 Democrats, one independent, no Republican members. Miami Congresswoman Donna Shalala became one of those supporters. After this week's developments, she spoke with us from Capitol Hill. Congresswoman, good morning. Great to see you this morning. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, let's sort of nail down your position here on impeachment. You were circumspect for a long time. During the Mueller investigation, you said uh, talking about impeachment is premature. And then this week, obviously, your friend Nancy Pelosi said we need an impeachment inquiry. And you agree. I did agree, and I had no choice. I think we had no choice. Um, what happened in the president's conversation with the leader of Ukraine is clearly an abuse of power, and it's time to start the impeachment inquiry. Let's be clear about what the president did. He asked the head of state of another country, dangling the aid that that country was going to receive, he asked him for a favor. What was the favor? It, get me some dirt on one of my political opponents. That's clearly an abuse of power. The use of the presidency improperly and illegally. Congresswoman, you I'm um, sure watched the DNI director Joseph McGuire's testimony uh, on Thursday. What what was your takeaway? Did you find his testimony? to have uh, maybe raise some questions that you and your colleagues need to answer before you go full blown into an impeachment inquiry? Well, that's part of the impeachment inquiry. We've actually started uh, the process. We, of course, there are additional facts because in addition, the president admitted uh, that he asked um, the Ukrainian uh, prime minister to investigate Joe Biden, to collect dirt on Joe Biden, uh, the presidential candidate. But more importantly, afterwards there was a cover-up. It's always the cover-up. The cover-up was, let's not let anyone know about this conversation. Uh, this is very serious and uh, it requires, it gave us no choice but to start the impeachment inquiry because it clearly is a misuse of the office of the president for private, for personal political purposes. Yeah. Congresswoman, President Trump has said repeatedly this week that it was a, quote, perfect telephone call with President Zelensky of Ukraine, that nothing wrong happened there. And he says, what's the big deal here? What, what if it is a big deal, what is the big deal? It is a big deal. It's an abuse of power by the President of the United States. It's using his office for personal political 
uh, reasons. And um, he's abusing the office of the president. You're not allowed to do that. Presidents are not allowed to call the country, another country, ask them to investigate, to interfere in the 2020 election. Congresswoman. Um, it's, it's more than against the law. It's using the office of the presidency for illegal purposes, and that is for personal political purposes. That is clearly an abuse of power. So, Congresswoman, all of those things that you're talking about, all of those allegations in the whistleblower complaint, the whistleblower that we're reading now is a CIA official, and I, that's not confirmed yet. Those things that the whistleblower alleges, he or she says, is not firsthand. This was an aggregate, really corroborated, though, by the White House readout or memo or transcript. I don't know what we're calling what the White House put out, but... Do you need to hear firsthand from that whistleblower? I believe so. I believe we, uh, I believe the American people need to hear from the whistleblower and from others that were involved. In addition to that, the president has sent his personal lawyer to the Ukraine uh, to urge the, the Ukrainian government uh, to collect dirt on uh, another political candidate. Uh, that personal lawyer also should be brought before the Congress to explain his actions because he used government resources, diplomatic resources, in the process. So there are a lot of facts that we need to absolutely pin down. We know the general things that happened because the president admitted them and there is a readout on his conversation. But I, I think that before we go forward with articles of impeachment, if we do, we need to pin down every single fact. But from what we have heard from the president and from his conversation with the Ukrainians, um, it's very clear that he dangled um, aid to Ukraine in exchange for um, that government digging up dirt on uh, Vice President Biden. Yeah, uh, Congresswoman, you're clearly referring to Rudy Giuliani, former mayor of New York and a longtime now personal attorney for President Trump. We know at one point at the president, at President Trump's request, he went to Madrid last summer, I guess, and he met with an emissary from President Zelensky. Uh, does that strike you as unethical, odd, improper, uh, inappropriate? for a private citizen, he was not going there as a representative of the United States government to go and negotiate uh, some delicate kind of agreements with uh, a, a leader from a foreign government? It's absolutely improper and, um, and probably illegal. We need to pin all of these facts down, lay them out for the American people. And in many ways, the American people have to hear them for themselves. The president has admitted uh, that he talked to the Ukrainian leader. Uh, he has admitted that they held off on aid for the Ukraine. Um, and the readout confirms all of that, as does the whistleblower, who clearly checked with others, as does the inspector general of the intelligence uh, group, who confirmed that it was a serious allegation uh, which he felt um, he had to report. Congresswoman Shalala, you had a front row seat as a cabinet member for Bill Clinton in 1998 uh, for the impeachment of Bill Clinton. We're gonna take a quick break and talk about that when we come right back. Welcome back. We are with Congresswoman Donna Shalala from Washington. Congresswoman, uh, before the break, we talked about the impeachment of Bill Clinton in 1998 when you were the cabinet member, the Health and Human Services Secretary, um, interested in hearing sort of a hindsight front row seat, much different time, different allegations, but, uh, but a presidential impeachment is something you have had experience with. What, what did you learn from that episode, if anything, that you can project in our time? that Congress has to be careful, be careful to assemble the facts and to communicate clearly with the American people through those facts 
and through anyone that will testify that give us additional facts. Um, I also uh, was in college during the Watergate hearings and clearly the cover up there uh, was uh, a major part of, uh, of the problem. But these are painful experiences. I don't take this lightly. I took a long time uh, before I was prepared to say we should go forward with an impeachment inquiry because of my previous experience, particularly uh, with President Clinton. Uh, in this case, it's both a cover-up and the President of the United States admitting that he tried to influence a foreign government using his position as President to influence a foreign government to investigate um, a political uh, opponent uh, and putting pressure on a foreign government using the presidency of the United States. You just cannot do that. And as I indicated, I take the whole issue of impeachment, impeachment my constitutional responsibility, very serious. This is a serious situation in which I believe we had no choice but to start moving forward. Yeah. Congresswoman, uh, on this very topic, David Brooks, the moderate to conservative columnist in the New York Times, has written this in Friday's New York Times. I want to put it up on our screen, and if you would listen, maybe you read this. He says, this is not, this impeachment is not what the country wants to talk about. Nancy Pelosi said she would not proceed with impeachment unless there was a bipartisan groundswell of support. There is no bipartisan groundswell, and yet she is proceeding. According to a Quinnipiac University poll, only 37 percent of Americans support impeachment. So what, what would you say to David Brooks about moving ahead with the inquiry? Well, I think that it's important that we fulfill our constitutional responsibility once the president has admitted improper behavior, serious improper behavior. None of us, I certainly have not uh, committed to an actual impeachment vote, but we have to bring along and make sure the American people understand the case. At the beginning of Watergate, no one quite could figure out what was going on. At the end of the process, the American people and both parties um, saw the evidence and saw the cover-up. So we're at the beginning of the process, and um, you can tell, and I can tell from my colleagues, that they're clearly uncomfortable with the president's behavior. The beginning and if his personal lawyer used diplomatic resources to schedule appointments with a political leader of another country on behalf of the president who wanted to interfere uh, in next year's election, that makes it even more serious. So we're at the beginning of the process, not at the end of the process, but we feel the responsibility, and I think the American people expect us from us to do a careful investigation and to lay out the facts. Congresswoman, the beginning of the investigation is the end of our conversation, and we uh, really appreciate you taking some Thank time you to be very with much. us today. Thank you. Stay with us, and we'll be right back.
Oh my goodness, it has been a week of seismic political events and we want to now analyze them with our Powerhouse Roundtable. And uh, as always, we've got a great one for you, so let's tell you who's here today. Mark Caputo reports for Politico. He's covering the 2020 presidential race with a special emphasis on Florida. Chris Smith is an attorney in Fort Lauderdale and a former Democratic state senator from Broward County. Saman Movasagi Gonzalez is founder and managing attorney at the Florida Immigration Law Council. It is so great to have you all here today. Got a lot to talk about. Boy, do we <laughs> ever. Uh, Mark Caputo, let me begin by asking you. I want to hear from everyone here. But, you know, has this reached the tipping point the last 10 days? Just startling political developments, kind of a tsunami effect that began with just this mention of a promise made by the president somehow. Then we saw the redacted transcript, then we saw the whistleblower complaint, then we heard about the alleged cover-up. I mean, how far does this go? It would be hard to see it not ending in impeachment, but considering the political sensitivities or complications or reality in Washington, it would be even harder to see President Trump being removed from office by the Senate if there is impeachment. Yeah, that would take 20 Republican senators joining every Democrat to because it takes two thirds vote of the Senate to convict. Right. You can analyze it two ways. One of them is just political survival. The reality is if, if you are a Republican, a, a Donald Trump has an almost religious like following. And if you're interested in staying office or making any policy, you're not going to vote to remove him. Uh, then there is the policy. The reality is, is that Donald Trump has delivered to a lot of his base specifically the evangelical base of all mm -hmm. things, uh, judges though, which you'll hear about quite frequently in abor abortion related matters. So this is the, the horse they're riding or the horse that some would say they're stuck on, but they're gonna have to ride it through. Isn't this, Chris, the, this is, if you take <coughs> politics out of it, which nobody <laughs> does, but let's just say we can, yeah. this is the first time, you know, there was a Mueller investigation, Mr. Mueller's investigation took two years. This is not only an allegation, but a corroboration from the White House to the whistleblower's allegations. It, at very least, it would be probable cause in a criminal inquiry. So in taking the politics out of it, why not go forward to investigate something like this? Well, I think the difference is this is one that the average citizen can follow. Mueller investigation was, well, he wasn't in office, he wasn't in office, we don't know about all this stuff, but anyone sitting around their kitchen table who watched an episode of Law and Order or watched any <laughs> kind of gangster show knows, you know, how these guys talk well, and who, are looking who, at who this. Who watched The Godfather, Yeah, and, 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 Yeah, and they can <laughs> say, okay, I hear what he said, I know what he meant, that's corruption and let's go. But one, one thing that, that I I've, haven't heard a lot of talk about is we keep saying that he wanted um, dirt on a political opponent, but more importantly, this was dirt on a former vice president, whether he's a political opponent or not. Yeah. I mean, and, and that kind of shocks the conscience that we have a current president going after a former person that held that office. And, and I think just as an American, it's like, why, why are we doing this? Yeah, uh, but so, he's so been my, running. Yeah, he, he's been running his uh, whole presidency like he's been running his business deals. I mean, even now we're reading reports that he's been shocked at why this is even going on and why this isn't even an issue that we're discussing mm -hmm. this, that he has to go around the whole politics to communicate with the president to get dirt on somebody else. I mean, this is what he's used to. These are his backdoor deals. And the fact that the whistleblower has came out and been able to obtain so much evidence and information in order to make it public is really surprising for him but for us it's like this is what we have been telling yeah. the american people of what's been going on with this administration yeah. i was just going to say dis despite all of that and despite the roughly third mm -hmm. of the country that will never go along yeah. with even an, impe an impeachment inquiry mm -hmm. there is corroboration from the white house I is mm -hmm. that not sort of the one thing you cannot get around, Mark, the corroboration of that call and, and an admission he, uh, the president asked for a favor from a foreign power related to an election. Right. Uh, I talked to uh, not a relative of mine with the same last name, Michael Caputo, who used to work for the Trump campaign, uh, has, sometimes uh, lives in Miami, uh, kind of a part-time Florida man, uh, worked in both Ukraine <laughs> and in Russia. Uh, Mike laid out for me the Republican and the uh, Trump point of view here, which is that they see the <laughs> Russia hoax, as they call it, having a very strong Ukrainian component. And as you read the 
quasi-transcript memo or whatever we want to call it, you'll see uh, President Trump is linking the uh, Russia probe and Ukraine. I, I think Rudy Giuliani was on George Stephanopoulos' mm -hmm. program prior to ours this morning saying that yep. that's not the case. Well, this is not the first time that Rudy Giuliani. That, no, no, no. That that it is that yeah. that Ukraine had nothing to do with Russia uh, Russia interference in the election. Right. Well, that's <laughs> that, that. This is not the first time that Trump world has spoken with three or four mouths. The the thing we do see is like, for instance, the uh, Paul Manafort, who's the former campaign manager for Donald Trump, was fired after a black book of his contacts was leaked. That came from Ukraine. Uh, so there's a very strong belief in Trump world that at the center of the Russia hoax, their words, is Ukraine. And this is partly what's driving the president. I'm not saying it excuses it, but they believe their cause is just and right. And he's just trying to find out the truth. And, yeah. and I would think you keep saying corroboration from the White House. I think they're corroborating maybe what was said, but their interpretation is totally different. And I think that's where they're hanging their hat on. Agreed, agreed. The, the, the Rashomon effect. We're, we're corroborating right. he yes. said it, but our interpretation is well, totally right, different. Right, but wouldn't that be the probable cause? In other yes. words, an investigation may find nothing. We're certainly open to that, yeah, but wouldn't that be the probable yeah. cause to find and, that and out? And I'm glad you used that term. Welcome back. We are in the midst of a very robust roundtable. <laughs> Um, uh, Chris Smith, as you well know, as you all know, uh, from West Palm Beach to Key West, there are seven members of Congress who represent South Florida. Six mm -hmm. of them are Democrats, and basically, well, you heard Donna Shalala earlier, now they all favor an inquiry, an a impeachment inquiry. The one who does not uh, is Representative Mario diaz Balart. Here is what he had to say this week in a statement we tried to speak with him by satellite. We could not do that. Let's put up the statement here from Representative diaz Ballard. He said, after reading the transcript, it's evident that yesterday's speculation and conjecture got ahead of the facts. There is clearly no quid pro quo. I'll continue to base myself on facts and the truth, and the facts I have seen most certainly do not warrant impeachment. And, and frankly, uh, Mark, I would say Representative diaz Ballard is kind of right. We haven't seen enough evidence to warrant impeachment. That's what the whole process is about. Right. I, I'm, I'm not sure his point. Maybe he's saying that no matter what happens, he, he's not going to vote for impeachment, which is probably the, that the case is anyway. Uh, the case. Uh, but yeah. I mean, the reality is, is as we've discussed here, essentially, uh, impeachment is essentially an indictment. There's enough mm -hmm. probable cause to proceed and, and, and go to kind of the grand jury, as it were, right. of the various House committees examining it. The question is, is if and when they actually do impeachment, how many articles, how many counts uh, mm -hmm. of impeachment will there be? We, we don't know. There are a number that there could be. Let's not forget that when President Trump was president, he had cut a check to his lawyer that was used to reimburse a former porn star, allegedly right. to keep her yeah. quiet. And that lawyer had already pleaded guilty to a criminal campaign finance violation. And the unindicted, or better said, the, the anonymous person in that indictment of President Trump's yeah. former lawyer is President Trump. So it uh, indicates I, he I, might I, have some real trouble. Yeah, I, I, I would bet, I don't know, Saman, you're a great lawyer, but I would bet that they are going to keep the, the focus here in this impeachment inquiry rather limited simply to this dealings between Trump and the Ukraine and Rudy Giuliani and everybody else well, who was involved. It, if it's a better argument for them and it's not to get distracted, I right. think that that should be the case. I mean, yes, there may not be enough evidence at this specific moment to do impeachment, but if there's enough evidence um, as for probable cause to open up an investigation, then that's where the Pro, you know, the process would begin from and then possibly to start impeachment proceedings. But I think that if they have enough evidence right now on what's going on with the transcript or even having maybe the whistleblower come out, and I think with those evidence, they'll be able to pursue it. They won't need to go to the porn star or any other previous no. dealings that have happened. Oh, what times we live in. Right? Right. <laughs> this is what we have to talk about, whether or not we get the president for porn or we get the president for doing a backdoor deal with the president of Ukraine. I think Senator Sass had a great point when he, I mean, he's kind of spoke to both sides. He said Democrats don't run for and with current impeachment, but Republicans, let's not circle the wagons. This is a process. This is now we're going to look for more evidence and see what's there. Mm -hmm. So I think on either side um, uh, of, of just saying now it's over, no more evidence, 
that's why we have this point now. That's why we got the next couple of weeks and Adam Schiff and his, his team are interviewing witnesses and finding more direct evidence. Let me ask you a question about, since you're another lawyer at the table, <laughs> you know, much has been said about the whistleblower does not have firsthand information <laughs> and, and so sort of cold from, cold from a number of sources um, and not to say that it isn't perfectly legitimate, mm. but people are raising the question of hearsay. How is the whistleblower's complaint different from what might be hearsay evidence? Almost every investigation starts with hearsay. I mean, you don't put the hearsay as evidence at trial to find someone guilty, but you got to start somewhere. Someone has to call the cops and say, hey, I heard this happen. Um, and if you talk about the Clinton trial, Linda Tripp said, hey, mm -hmm. I heard about this thing that the president did. So, I mean, for, for even lawyers in the Congress to say, oh, it's hearsay, and people so be so disingenuous about hearsay, investigations start with hearsay. Every investigation, be it Bill Clinton, be it the guy who robbed the local liquor store, you got to start somewhere and have the investigation to find the evidence. Good explanation, thanks. Uh, let's go back uh, before we go on to other aspects of this to, to the Florida's, Florida's two senators, Rick Scott and Marco Rubio. And Mark, this week, Marco Rubio essentially said, um, I'm, I, I don't know that it was a great idea to uh, have that conversation, but, uh, you know, this is all revenge for having lost the election in 2016. Rick Scott said the same thing. I mean, they're sort of dancing around this. Well, yes, but their alternative is to not stand by President Trump. Yeah. And Rubio has done a great job kind of reinventing himself from the person who on the campaign trail warned that President Trump or Donald Trump would have been an erratic president, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, mocked his hand size, uh, as we remember. And now Marco Rubio has a great amount of influence in the Western Hemisphere, right. which is the kind of one Venezuela, of his Venezuela, Cuba, yeah. Right, so uh, he's not willing to trade that in. And uh, in Rick Scott's case, he's just always been aligned kind of philosophically or personally with the president. I don't see much changing there. How yeah. do you see the timeline for this going? 2020 elections, oh. I mean, legitimately start in a matter of months in Iowa. I, you know, that that's a they compact. They got to go quick. I do mean, they? Or, right, no, no, that's I what's think in, do they? No, to have an impeachment, mm -hmm. you have to go quick because something else is going to happen. I mean, things right. happen so fast. <laughs> and if they wait too long, if the Congress mm -hmm. takes too long between now and December, something's going to happen somewhere. And takes, so while people are thinking about this, while people are looking at this and looking at the evidence, they're going to have to move quickly on it. Yeah, but well representative, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, tonight. I was going to say, do you think the Democrats at this point right now, close to the election, even want him to be impeached? Their base does. That's and an interesting I, question. That is, what you're seeing in polling is two-thirds to 70 percent of Democrats are pro-impeachment. And that was before the Ukraine call. And I would imagine those numbers are even higher. Yeah. At a certain point, politicians all politicians respond to their base, yeah. and their bases are calling. And I think the base are calling for him to do yeah. something because the base are looking at, okay, this guy did this, and you guys just said something. He did this, you said something. He did this. So the base is saying, finally, do something. Yeah. Does the base know historically that the very few impeachments that have happened hmm. have been, in the following you know year, have been detrimental yeah. to the party? I don't know how true that is, no. incidentally. I mean, remember that Al Gore probably would have been president had there not been 30,000 spoiled ballots in Palm Beach County mm -hmm. and 20,000 spoiled ballots in Duval County alone. So that kind of shoots that down. He was the also... The Brooks Brothers Suit Rebellion, what did they oh, call that? Oh, yeah, that was the Brooks Brothers riot. And I didn't even mention Miami-Dade County. It's something like 15,000 spoiled ballots. I mean, we're... So... So that's kind of disproved. Also, Al Gore in 2000 won a majority vote. Yeah. So Democrats actually did rather well in 2000. So well, I'm, in I'm 2000. not sure that applies. And I think another important point is this, is you just mentioned uh, the Brooks column in the yeah. New York Times yes. earlier, and he pointed out how few people support impeachment. Well, a lot of people didn't support the reporting about Hillary Clinton's emails before 2016. And yet there was still a steady drumbeat of those mm -hmm. reports about those emails, and it affected public opinion in the end, according to Democrats. The same thing can happen with impeachment, is though people might say, hey, I don't want to see it, the drumbeat of information against Donald Trump might be de detrimental to his political health. All right, we're going to take a brief break. When we come back, we're going to talk, among other things, about Scott Israel and whether he may be reinstated uh, as sheriff by the Florida Senate.
Welcome back. Turning to some news that kind of really shook up, especially Broward County this week, when uh, Special Masters, the State Senate's Special Master Dudley Goodlett, issued a recommendation that the suspended Broward Sheriff, Scott Israel, deserves to get his job back after he was in Tallahassee in June, appealing the governor's suspension of him for all that went wrong in Marjorie Stoneman Douglas mm -hmm. High and Fort Lauderdale's mass shooting. Uh, that recommendation, Chris Smith, <laughs> was that surprising to you as it surprised so many? Uh, not at all, for a couple of reasons. One, I, I served with Dudley Goodlett, and knowing the type of person that he is, he is a lawyer's lawyer. A he's former the Republican lawmaker. Republican say, lawmaker. Yeah. We served in the House together. Yeah. Um, and he's one of those guys that the Florida bar comes to a lot in the legislature. So he's a lawyer's lawyer. So I knew he would follow the facts. And then being up there at the trial, I was at the trial, and to see the lack of evidence as to the allegations, I kind of saw which way Dudley was going. Because if you, if you watch the trial and watch the lack of evidence as to the allegations that's thrown out there, there was really no way for Dudley to really rule. The, the, yeah. uh, the not only lack, well, it's not so much a lack of evidence as a lack of a case. The governor's mm -hmm. attorney did not put on a case. Uh, Sheriff, suspended Sheriff Israel did. Mm -hmm. And now it goes to the Senate Rules Committee well, and then the full Senate. And but I just I wanted to ask Mr. Mm -hmm. Politics over there. The special master said, I know the sheriff had said this was politically motivated by the governor. He put that out there. But what the special master said was, I'm not looking at any politics, no motivations, that's not a consideration, I'm looking at the evidence. So now politics is sort of the headline. It's shock, shock, there's politics <laughs> going on in the Florida Senate. Yeah, there's 23 yeah. Republicans yeah, out of the 40 member Senate. Uh, here's, here's what this comes down to at this point. Are there 21 votes to remove Scott Israel permanently? I mean, I still think, yeah, because there are 23 Republicans. Republicans hate Scott Israel. Uh, the Republican governor had him suspended. So it's probably leaning that way. Yeah, and someone beyond yeah. that, here we are two and a half months from the beginning of a legislative session where the agenda is in large part driven by the governor who has veto power over spending. Uh, and these guys don't want to get crossways you know, with the governor. But it's, it's, it's going to be tough. And when the Senate appointed Dudley Goodlett as the hearing officer, I, talk, I took that as a signal that they were taking this thing serious because there are political hacks that you can appoint to, to come yeah. up with the report you want. Dudley Goodlett is far from being a political hack and being a Republican legislator and also uh, was counsel in the House. So I took it that the Senate was really going to look at, we want to get this done fairly. But uh, for them to decide, this is the decision they have. Do we follow a governor who's mm -hmm. saying emotionally we need to blame somebody, hold somebody accountable, or do we follow someone we serve besides, a lawyer's lawyer who looked at the facts and said, don't do this. And if they decide to keep him removed, that clearly is political. And I mean, there's, there's no other way to look at it. I was going to say, I don't think that this topic could be any less political than it already is. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you said it perfectly correct. Mm -hmm. I mean. The fact that they want to go after Scott Israel for negligence and for not doing his duties properly, it's going to set a very bizarre standard for when these c catastrophic events occur. Who, you know, where does the buck stop? Who gets the blame well, for this? Any of it. And I, and I hate to keep going back, but in Orlando this week, you had an officer you, uh, arrest a six year old and an eight year old. Right. Fingerprint, take them down, take pictures and everything. Should the sheriff so now, go down is that for that? Sheriff? Sheriff take him out because, of course, that officer wasn't trained right. well and wasn't trained, and so they arrested a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. Answer that question. I mean, no, they shouldn't. <laughs> I mean, and I think Dudley Goodlett answered that question. Right. He said, if you have procedures in place and if you have training in place, which the record shows there was procedures and training for these officers to react a certain way, if that officer don't react that certain way, you're setting a bad precedent to just automatically remove the sheriff. And if the Senate does this, I think you're going to have, after every single incident in the state of Florida, you're going to have legislators running to the governor saying, hey, yeah. let's remove this, the, move, remove this person. It's going to be a sting, though, to the governor because this is the flag that he was flying. And three days after he was uh, elected, he went ahead and removed right. him. And, so. and he promised the Parkland right. parents yes. right. he would do this, yeah. and he made good on his promise. But, you know, Mark, just strategically, politically, um, if Scott Israel is not reinstated by the state Senate in his reelection campaign, he says he's going to run for reelection, he's going to say, 
a reputable, upstanding Republican special master looked into it, and he said, I didn't do anything wrong, so reelect me. Of course, and this is the People's Republic of Broward County we're in. <laughs> <laughs> it is not your favorite republic. <laughs> it is, it is, Broward is the Florida of Florida as well. Uh, this is a county where hating the Republican is going to be great. You could not hand Scott Israel a better campaign uh, yeah. tool than to run against the governor who is largely despised by the very great number of Democrats who populate this county. Right. Chris was talking to earlier, he thinks that, that uh, the sheriff, or better said, the former sheriff, Israel, probably has an inside straight or an inside shot of winning the election anyway. Yeah, because I mean, he, he just comes out and say, hey, they removed me only for political purposes. Do we want Republicans in Tallahassee running Broward County? I mean, this, this will be decided in a Democratic primary, and I think that's the biggest difference. It's not a nonpartisan race. This will be a Democratic primary mm -hmm. where you will have a Republican governor and then a Republican Senate, if they don't reinstate him, giving him that inside straight. So in the, in the primary, who is uh, Sheriff Tony, that's the current sheriff, exactly who I was Tony, ask for. Mm -hmm. is running as a Democrat yes. in the primary? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he's, he did say he was going to run? Yes, he's yes. running as, okay. he's running so. as a Democrat as a Democrat in a Democratic primary, a crowded Democratic primary. Right. So the Broward. winner will be determined in August. I mean, mm -hmm. the primary, yeah. forget it, that's yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, well, let's see this to the end then. So you have a current sheriff, if he is doing mm -hmm. an exemplary job, and he is a Democrat in a Democratic county, why wouldn't a voter vote for him? Because he shouldn't be there. The voter said, well, he shouldn't be there in the first place. Why are we gonna punish Scott Israel and keep that punishment going by these Republicans. These people sitting up in Tallahassee that are not in Broward, that have nothing to do with Broward. Well, governor. Well, some, but, some do. Yeah, yeah, yeah some, <laughs> some, some do. do. But you, I, I foresee your Broward senators all voting to reinstate. Your Broward residents are saying, we can't, even though this guy's done a good job and the current sheriff has done some, has done some stuff, mm -hmm. but he shouldn't be there in the first place. This report clearly shows that this was a political power grab by Tallahassee and Broward Democrats aren't going to allow that political power grab to continue. You know what, I, I just, uh, whenever we talk about something like this, I think about the Parkland parents mm -hmm. and someone mm -hmm. being, or something, or someone's mm -hmm. being held responsible for what mm -hmm. happened. And really, that has not happened yet. The people in the many, some have, I should say, the many layers of things that have gone wrong, those parents have not yet seen yeah. justice and accountability. That happened in, in January in when January, Nicholas Cruz when the, goes on trial. When the trial yeah. takes place in January, uh, Nicholas Cruz, uh, who I don't think there's any question <laughs> yes. about his guilt, the only question is about the punishment. Right. Is it death or life in prison? If he pled guilty, it mm -hmm. would be life in prison. Sure would be nice if the FBI did its damn job, though. I, there yeah. are you know, layers prior right. to... There, there, were, there, yes. they were, there were warnings and warnings that were pretty clear mm -hmm. and well. For yeah. one reason or another, that didn't happen. And the BSO failed them and the school system. Yeah. Many failures led to it. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you all. Great yeah. round table. Thank Come you. back mm -hmm. again. Maybe next Very week. Very soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, still to come. So My <laughs> personal <laughs> perspective about Governor Ron DeSantis calling the impeachment process, quote, disgusting. Is that going too far? Take a look at this beautiful picture times for our tower cams across South Florida. And uh, we will, in a second, go to weather authority meteorologist Brandon Orr. But I've got to say, looks like a pretty good day for a football game. And maybe the Dolphins, uh, Glenna, will surprise us. Or am I just being <laughs> overly optimistic? Uh, okay. I, I may head to the beach. But hey, <laughs> let's see what's up for today. Brandon. Hey guys, yeah, really nice Sunday forecast. 87 degrees because we're cooler and less humid than yesterday and only have a 20% chance of rain and many of us are gonna stay dry. There's the humidity that we had around this morning, tends to fade on out going into the afternoon. Not nearly as humid, it's actually looking pretty nice. It's breezy though, seeing some wind gusts up to 27 miles per hour, but tomorrow, maybe as high as 30 to 35 miles per hour. So very breezy start to the work week. Occasional bumps in moisture, so we'll get some showers every once in a while, and that deep tropical moisture tries to move in by the end of the work week into next weekend. So I have rain chances up to 50% by next Saturday, guys. Brandon, thanks. All right, before we leave you this morning, a personal perspective about 
impeaching a president. I have lived through and reported on two presidential impeachments. The first, Richard Nixon, 1973. The second, Bill Clinton, 1996. He survived it, although there will always be that impeachment asterisk by Clinton's name. It's much too early to know what will happen to this nascent effort to impeach Donald Trump. We have seen the rough transcript of the call and read the whistleblower's complaint, and that is disturbing, to say the least. Now, we need to see whatever evidence Congress can dig up and hear from the witnesses, and then when we've heard all of that, we have to weigh it carefully, thoughtfully, fairly, and particularly those of us in the news media. Political leaders need to do the same. But I was disappointed this week when Governor Ron DeSantis did not. He popped off. The Republican Party of Florida sent out an over-the-top statement on Friday signed by the governor. It said, quote, as governor of Florida, I want the president to know we have his back 100 percent. So today I'm issuing the Presidential Protection Fund to fight back against this disgusting attempt to overturn a legitimate U.S. election. Whoa, a disgusting attempt? How so? On Friday, I asked the governor about it. The Founding Fathers, if you read the Federalists, I mean, Hamilton warned against uh, this being used for partisan purposes. And I think that if it's a partisan attack, that's not what it was meant for. Well, that is a clever response. Very few politicians are going to cite Alexander Hamilton and the Federalist Papers. But here's the part that Governor DeSantis left out. In Federalist 65, Alexander Hamilton wrote that impeachment was included not just for crimes, but for acts that were, quote, an abuse or a violation of some public trust. And that is the issue before us. Did the president betray the public trust? The governor is a smart guy. He knows that words have consequences. The words he used here were boilerplate political hack work beneath him and insulting to us. Impeachment is in the Constitution for times like these. They are trying times, but they are not disgusting. That is my perspective for the week. Hope you have a wonderful Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed. Get involved. And get online. You can catch any of our programs right there on local10.com. And you can also subscribe online to our This Week in South Florida podcast. Stay tuned right here for SoFlo Health and have a beautiful Sunday.